Um, it's, I promise it's going to be worth it. So let's get started. Um, do you guys remember that time that you totally nailed it at an interview? And maybe some other time that you didn't do quite well? And were you able to figure out what went differently and why you got different results? Interviewing, interviewing for a job is never a piece of cake. It takes a lot of courage, spectacular communication skills, and extensive prep. And every now and then, stars need to align. You need to be wearing your lucky underwear. You know, like I get it. It's a tough job. Um, when I had my first interview um, 15 years ago, I wish someone told me about these golden rules of interviewing. That took me over a decade to learn. If you follow these rules religiously, I guarantee you, you can get the job of your dreams. Today, um, I'll talk about how to crack the product manager interview. But before we get started, my name is Valentine, and I'm the SVP of product at Benzentown. For those of you who may not be familiar with Benzentown, um, go ahead and download it. It's the number one concert discovery platform. Based on your specific music taste, we curate a list of um, personalized shows, events, DJ gigs, festivals, so basically all sorts of live music events. It's definitely worth checking it out. Before Bands in Town, I worked close to eight years at Facebook in Ireland, India, and the US, spanning um, a variety of different roles. And prior to that, I was at Colgate and Conolive and um, IBM. So throughout my career, I probably interviewed around like 2,000 people, and every so often, I get this stellar candidate, and I witness them do so poorly in the interview just because they don't follow these basic principles. So what are they? Let's take a look at it. But I really want this to be a very interactive session. The group size is big, but still, feel free to ask, ask questions at any point if you have any throughout the presentation. Oh, and um, by the way, one more thing. When I worked at Facebook, Mark Zuckerberg had this policy. He banned wasting time on any fancy slides. And also, Katie, the, inter the organizer of this event, asked me to create um, black and white slides so that they show up in the video. So today, I'm standing before you with a series of very ugly slides. <laughs> but I promise the content is the real deal, and you're going to like it. And, oh, today's theme is movies, so get your popcorns ready. <laughs> Has anyone seen this movie? Yeah? Um, it's a very silly movie, but there is a very important life lesson to be learned. For those of you who haven't seen the movie, it's about these two dudes who are invited to North Korea to interview the leader of the country. And they spent the entire first half of the movie prepping for the interview which is the number one rule, the most important rule, prep, prep, and more prep. If you have the perfect prep, not only you'll be able to answer all questions, but it will also boost your confidence before and during the interview. Make sure to digest the entire company website, learn their mission, vision, and their overall strategies. Google is your best friend. Scan the entire internet, read all the articles that I've written. And I can't emphasize enough how important it is for you to use their product and services because you need to put yourself in the shoes of their target customer. Also, you utilize their competitors, other stakeholders in the industry because that will help you position the company um, within the market and competition. So you've made great efforts to prep and now it's ready to rock. You start the interview, you have so much to say, so much, because you want to prove to them that you are the best fit for this role, right? So you'll talk and talk and talk. My best advice to you is to pause. <laughs> Just pause. PMs need to have spectacular communication skills, so be very succinct. Elevator pitches are always the winner rather than a convoluted proposal with so many unnecessary minor details. If you can't articulate your idea in two or three minutes, you know it's probably not a good idea. And if you find yourself talking more than five minutes, you're probably not being articulate enough and you're just <coughs> rambling and sharing too many details. 
So be very, um, be very selective with what information um, you share. If I ask you a question, I'd rather have you pause and think about it for 30 seconds and then give it to me in one shot very succinctly rather than jumping the gun right away and just a cluttering your communication with all these details. So be very selective. I say pause, reflect, strategize, and then communicate. And this will help you be very um, succinct with your communication. So interviewers like to hear about how your past experiences actually relate to this job position you're interviewing for. Giving a variety of examples always help um, because that's how you show your applicable skills and background expertise. When you're go going over your resume, do not try to cover everything on that resume. It's unnecessary. Just pick the ones that are relevant. Every so often, I people are like, they will not shut up because they have so much to cover in their resume. And it's not good, you're not doing me a favor either. Because A, I have limited capacity to retain information, and B, I'm probably distracted with all these things going on. So be very selective and pick the relevant one. Explain your past experiences clearly, and talk about how the skills that you gain on the job are directly applicable to this new one. As you talk about your work experience, it's key to quantify the impact. This is really important. Impact in terms of success metrics and KPIs. So, yes, you built this app, you're proud of it, you talk about the app, but your communication is not complete until you actually follow up with actual results. I just don't want to hear about what you did, but what did you achieve? That's my question. How many people use your app? How many stars did you get on the App Store? Um, how much revenue did you bring? Um, what's the average time spent on your website, on your website perhaps? So whatever metric that shows success for this project. The second situation where focusing on impact comes into play is prioritization. You guys may be familiar with prioritization exercise. There are several criteria, like impact is one of them. There's um, cost, there is resource allocation, dependencies, and there's the long list. But impact is the very first box you need to check. If the impact is not there and you cannot quantify it, then you should probably not even go through that card station exercise because you are not socially convinced that it's a good idea. Okay, bring on your new ideas. This is really important. Guys, no matter what job you apply for, you will be hired to make a change in that company. You're expected to bring a fresh pair of eyes and be very critical and take the product to the next level. When I interview people, if they can't throw a couple of ideas at me or like things, how many things to improve, I don't really know why I should hire that person. So the interviewer, also is, is interested in knowing how you tackle problems on a daily basis and how you would improve the product. They analyze and evaluate your answers by um, using a set of criteria such as creativity, creativity, measurability, scalability, feasibility, and so on and so forth. And they do that by asking problem-solving questions, also known as critical thinking questions. Every now and then, they may catch you off guard and they may ask you something that's totally out of your comfort zone. For example, design a parking lot. You're like, what? Well, that was not my job. It's, it's okay. They're trying to understand how you would go about it. And there are steps that you can take. The first one is, do not answer right away. Just take a second to compose your thoughts. Clarify the context if it's not clear. Like, what are we trying to accomplish? Ask them about the goals, ask them about the problem. So oftentimes, when people get these questions, they have this urge to um, answer it, which is great, which is what you should be doing. But just very few candidates in my experience actually follow up with a question to clarify. Because only if you know what they have in their mind, then you can address it. If five people ask, 
the same question. Maybe I'm concerned about um, electric cars. So there needs to be quiet. So that's what I'm trying to address. But the other person is trying to address a different um, business problem. So if you understand that and ask for additional context, it will always help you um, answer these questions in a much better way. Where is exactly? Well, that's a good one. Okay, so this is the most important part of this presentation that I'm about to cover. If there is one single thing you should take from this presentation, and it should be this, so listen up guys. When you're asked to offer an innovation, think about the big solutions. It sounds very simple and easy when I say it, but it's actually not. So let me tell you what I actually mean. I'll give you a couple of examples. In the beginning of my career, when I interviewed people, I would ask them, okay, can you tell me something to fix on our app? What are we improving? And then they would give me answers like, oh yeah, so like this filtering option seems kind of broken. It's not very clear to me, like you should probably fix that. I'm like, great, I'll do that. But is that meaningful enough? But if I fix that filtering option that people may or may not be using, will that really help me increase the engagement on the app? That's questionable. So I learned to alter my question. And now I ask the question a different way. I say, what is the number one thing to fix on the app? This very moment, I'm going to drop, stop everything that I'm doing, and I'm going to fix this problem because I know it's creating negative user experience. It's just so important. It changes perspective completely, right? So now you're not you're not going to just talk about that filtering option. You're probably going to go back to that Rolodex of all these ideas that you put together and then pick the one that's really going to move the needle and help me. So it's really important that you think about that number one thing. Another example, I used to ask, hey, Mr. Candidate, tell me your, give me a product idea. Yeah, I would get a couple of product ideas, but never that groundbreaking or satisfactory for my standards. So now I ask, what is your million dollar product idea? And I will not settle for anything less than a million. Tell me something that I have never heard before, but I haven't thought about it. Like no one is doing it in the market. If my competitors even didn't think about it. But you need to tell me, and I should have that wow, mind blown moment. That's what I'm looking for, and that's how you're going to get hired. So it's really, really important. So now, granted, by now I'm an Olympic interviewer, so I know my shit. Oh, I wasn't going to say that. Right? <laughs> um, but you will go to some interviews, and the questions are not always going to be as inspiring. They're not going to be like, you need the biggest thing. They're just going to give it to you plain and simple, like, give me a product idea. When that happens, guys, I want my voice to echo in your mind and say, give me the big one, million dollar idea, the number one thing to fix. So you should perceive that question and give it to them, a big, big one. And that's, my friend, is how you solve problem solving problems. Next up, the interviewers want to see if you're data oriented. They may give you a couple of different scenarios to see how you would approach each scenario with a data-driven approach, so that's pretty uh, common. Or, they may also ask you an estimation question. For example, how many people are sleeping in the world right this moment? That's an estimation question. I'll give you guys a secret. The answer doesn't matter. And quite frankly, nobody knows the answer. Also, the answer changes every minute depending on the time of the day, right? Like when you ask this question. So they want to hear about your, your approach. They want to see your thought process. Are you able to break down this problem? This is what they're interested in seeing, not your answer. So talk about your thought process, your approach, to get that answer. Let's do a little exercise, should we? This is how you could respond to this um, estimation question in a couple of steps. The first step, feel free to make assumptions, otherwise it's just going to be too wild. 
your first assumption could be, well, I think the average person sleeps eight hours, and I'm going to assume that they go to bed at 11 p.m. and wake up at 7, right? So that I have a starting point. Without an assumption, you never have a starting point. Step two, use logic and mathematics if needed. So it's 7 p.m. here right now, exactly. So, okay, 11, so four hours ahead is 11 p.m. is when people start going to bed. So four hours, some geography, right, logic. So that takes us to the beginning of Africa. And then you say, okay, people sleep eight hours. That was my assumption. So um, add eight hours to that, which brings us to 12 hours in total, four plus eight. Are you guys following? Yeah? So 12 hours is the, um, the time range I'm looking at. Step three, use some knowledge that you already have. So I know for a fact that um, Singapore is 13 hours ahead because my best friend lives in Singapore. So I say, oh, okay, the time difference I was looking for was 12 hours, so it has to be before Singapore, right? Um, or for you guys, Singapore is actually here. Um, so step four, use some more logic. So you said, okay, people start going to bed this moment in Africa, in the beginning of Africa. So I'm covering Africa, Europe, and some half of mainland Asia. That's the region that people are sleeping. So all I have to do is calculate, figure out how many people are living there. So I know Africa is 1.2 million, Europe is like 8 million people, so that's 2 million. So I'm probably looking at anywhere between 2.4 to 2.6. That's my assumption. So this is how you could solve it. Or, there's also a much simpler way. Feel free to use shortcuts if that's more like your personality. You could say, <coughs> go back to your assumption, average person sleeps eight hours, that's what we said. Okay, there are 24 time zones in the world, so 24 divided by eight, three. So one third of this world, this moment, should be sleeping. World population is 7.5 billion divided by three, it's 2.5 is my answer. Three, that, does anybody know the answer? No, nobody cares. You're interested in how I'm getting to this answer. This, is, this, this was a simple exercise. So always think out loud so that they know what, um, what the process you're, you're following. Yeah, first. The question was, in my experience, how common are the estimation questions? So. I have to be honest, I probably have limited experience to what other people are doing, because when I'm in an interview, I only know what I'm asking. Um, I personally am not the biggest fan of estimation questions, um, because they're not as targeted. I like to give two or three scenarios that the challenges that I am facing on a day-to-day -day basis, and actually like ask them about a challenge that I faced that morning or the day before, and say, hey, Instead of just being very hypothetical, to say, hey, like, this is the challenge, this is the scenario, how would you go about solving it? And then I like, try to get what data points that they would use, what metrics they would look at, how would, how would they go about solving that problem. But I know that. Of course, that's a great one. So, one challenge that um, we actually faced, Rebecca, raise your hand. So head of, our head of marketing is here to support me. Rebecca and I challenged because we have this, we looked at the data and our acquisition dropped by X percentage um, in the course of a couple of weeks. So then I asked, as a product manager, you come into work and then you look at the data and you realize that the new user acquisition or engagement, whatever that metric is, this the new user acquisition dropped by 30% week over week. Something is going on. How would you go about solving this problem? Then I expect things like, oh, first I would look at all the acquisition channels, like there are 12 different acquisition channels that we get. I would look at data individually and see which acquisition channels contributed to that um, low rate. So maybe 10 of them are okay, but two of them, I see that, oh, okay, this is the cause of the problem. Then I double click on that. So. That's a good example of a real-time scenario that um, I have, so I expect you guys to generate ideas. And obviously, you guys are not going to fix the um, problem, 
And honestly, I don't even know the answer. That's a problem that I faced this morning. So I'm, I'm curious to hear how you feel about it. Good question. Cool. And there comes the situational questions. To cover your soft skills, like leadership, communication, teamwork, any kind of soft skill. These questions often um, sound like once upon a time. Like they, they are typically a couple of examples. Tell me a time you managed a team, or tell me a time you had a challenge, or tell me a time you had a disagreement with your peers and you had to communicate a change or tell me a time. Blah, blah, blah. So to answer these questions, this is actually pretty important too. To answer these questions, you will get this. <coughs> to answer these questions, you need to go down the memory lane and think about uh, relevant scenarios. Some of you may have an amazing imagination and creativity, but never make up answers because the interviewer will again like probe into a double click, ask a couple of follow up questions, and then you will be like, oh. And also, you don't see yourself when you interview. I've seen again like 2,000 of you interviewing. I can always tell your face when you're trying to think of an answer rather than telling me something that has already happened. So I see through you, there's no fooling me here, or anyone. So always pick relevant, genuine, honest, personal examples. So how do you do it? Like there are 100 to 200 different situation questions, right? Like how do you do that? It's practice, like anything in life. We need to flex that muscle. If you want that beach body, you have to work out every day. Same, you have to exercise. My best tip to you is go to glassdoor.com, go to LinkedIn, go to Google, and find the most commonly asked situational soft skill questions and grab like the top 100, and that should be your bad time reading. And every day, pick 10 questions and answer, like take an hour, take a couple of, like maybe five minutes per question, and maybe write it down. So you got to flex this muscle and answer. The more and practice you do with those questions, the better it's going to be. And um, I'll get to you in a second. And one question that I always get, um, there are some young faces in the um, audience tonight, if, especially from more junior people I get, but Valentine, like I don't have 10 years of experience. Like what do I talk about? Like, I've, I've been working for two years. Like it's challenging. No, it's not. Because remember a time that you were in college and you were the group leader for a group project and everybody disagreed and you pushed your idea and you guys won the best project award? Like, talk about that. Remember a time that you volunteered for a charity and you had to coordinate all these people? Like, maybe you don't have experience with cross functional teams, but how about that? That's pretty applicable. I understand you never managed a team, that's fair, but what about in your past job? You, own the new hire onboarding single-handedly. You trained them, you were in charge of their productivity, their quality scores, you mentored them, somehow managed them, so that's also a thing. So think about everything, college, volunteer um, work, your personal life, friendships, like any kind of experience will qualify to answer these situational questions. Um, do you recommend kind of using the CAR or SAR framework when you go about that? The challenge action result method where you kind of identify a situation or challenge, what you did, what the action you took was, and then what it resulted in? Like, is that something you commonly would look for? Totally. Um, I don't necessarily look for a specific um, approach, but that's one that I like. If you guys are not familiar, so my understanding of that is you first um, give information on that situation because if you just tell me, oh yeah, like I had a disagreement with my peer and this is why I did, but I'm like, what is the context? So always give me the context. Thank you so much for asking that question. Actually, it's, it wasn't even part of my presentation. So first, tell me what the context is. What were you doing? What was the challenge? And the second one, give me the situation. Try to be as objective as possible. Um, and then the third one is what you did, and then the fourth one, what you learned, and also focus with the impact, so the results. Yeah. 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 
That's a, that's a great one. Actually, I was going to get that at the very end, but now that you asked it, I'll tell it. He asks, what if they ask you to tell something negative about yourself? Like, like what are your shortcomings? Like, what are your challenges? Right. Weaknesses, yeah. I don't like that word, but yes, weaknesses. So, on the internet, this is, I find this hilarious, so I hope you guys are going to have a good laugh too. On the internet, I always read, when they ask you about your weaknesses, you have to make it sound like something very positive. For example, tell me one weakness. I'm like, oh, I'm such a perfectionist. I like everything I do. It needs to be so perfect. I'm like, gets in the way. Or they ask, like, oh, like, um, what are your shortcomings? Tell me some area of development. And you go, oh, I'm such a workaholic. I have no work life balance. Oh, I work so much. Like, you see what I'm doing? It's like trying to make it sound like, is it like, negative but it's also positive, like don't do that. Don't do that. It's not helping you. It doesn't look good. And I don't know why internet is full of this advice. Just give it straight and honest. Here's what you can do. When you talk about your weaknesses, what's up for admiration is your plan to overcome. For example, you are applying for this data job. You haven't taken this product school data class yet that they just presented. Shameless plug. Um, so you have limited data knowledge, right? And this actually happened to me a couple of weeks ago for a junior product manager role. He was great, but data I could tell, and I told him like it's, um, this is the right play. For the second round, when he came, he said, "Okay, I know that data." Is a is concern, but I signed up to XYZ school. I'm going to be doing this on Saturdays for five hours for six weeks. Um, and I also signed up to Linda. I'm doing that. I'm going to apply for XYZ certification. So it is my plan to interview in this area. One of the things that I was challenged in the past was prioritization. So I had a problem with like prioritizing things throughout my day. Um, so I told it. Like I said, hey, this is one of the things that I'm getting help with my mentors. Um, trying, and these are the things that, that I'm doing. Like I have this prioritization card. I'm using um, Asana, like the prioritization and task management tool. So like, it's be very honest. Talk about your weaknesses, but always make sure that you have a plan to address it. Thanks so much for asking that question. Okay, so. Long story short, once upon a time, there was a genuine, um, honest person, and that person got the job because he flexed his muscle and he practiced these questions. And there's no other easy way. So uh, there's no easy way out. Okay, this one is a good one too. It always makes me giggle, guys. Remember that you're applying for a PM role. If you're interviewing for a product role and give examples of marketing initiatives, you're not on the right track. I was interviewing someone a couple of weeks ago, and I said, "Okay, what are you? What are some strategies that you can use to um, expand our user base, acquire more users?" And the young gentleman answered the question, "Oh, I would run some paid media, create some Facebook and App Store campaigns." Um, I would um, have some brand partnerships with festivals and labels. I would um, give away like free stuff to increase brand awareness. And like I had to pause that person. And this is definitely not my style. Like never interrupt people. But I had to. I said and these are all great examples. And if you interview for the marketing role, you would totally get the job. But these are not the things that we do in the product team. Like none of it. None of it. Like. It's not. So I understand that some of you may have different backgrounds and you have experiences in different areas in life and you want to convey that, you want to show your experience. But do yourself a favor. Answer, do not answer, do not answer these questions from the domain of your past experiences. Answer them from the domain of the role that you're interviewing for. And always keep it on the right track. So, you think you did a good job, you're feeling good, now you're ready to end the interview, not quite yet. You're not done. 
the questions you ask at the end of the interview may make it or break it. Refrain from asking questions that can be Googled easily to find answers. Make sure that you have a long list of questions um, that you can ask for. Uh, if not long, but good questions. And you know what? This is so important. I'll give you guys a couple of examples, but every so often, the questions change the, my entire opinion on the interview. For example, um, it's very common that I will not have a positive opinion on the candidate, and I'm like, okay, I'm ready to leave, like, God, please finish this interview. And I'm like, do you have a question before I go? And they ask me a question, and I'm like, Phew. Mind blown. I'm like, where did they just like punch? I didn't see that coming. And I'm like, tell me more. Like, actually, I think I can be a couple minutes late to my meeting. Like, tell me more. What do you think? And then another question. I'm like, wow. It's like, what's going on? Like, I want to hire you this moment before you leave to go. And, and I thought you were a lead hire. So it's common because keep in mind that I, as an interviewer, I'm going to that. Room and I have a checklist, right? Like I'm, I have my criteria that I evaluate. But more often than not, you may have different set of skills, which may be really useful. And that's how you can shine. That's how you can uh, convey that with your questions. It's your turn. Like if, for example, let's say this is a random example that I just thought about it. I'm not even sure if it's going to land well, but I need to tell it now. Um, I love karaoke, and I have a couple of built-in karaoke songs, right? Because um, I know that I can deliver, otherwise karaoke is not my strength. So I always go like ask for those questions, for those songs, because I know I'm going to do a good job. In the interview, it's similar analogy. It's like I picked every single song for you, and you have to sing. This is your chance to be like, hey, can you put Backstreet Boys, and I'm going to rock my jam. Like, what, if, what, you wanna, what, what is it that you want to talk about that you are so proud? And actually, like, you go into the interview, you may be overwhelmed, you may be anxious, you may be excited, right? And maybe you couldn't show your true potential. That's okay. But not having good questions, there's no excuse for that because you have days to prep, right? You could have um, interviewed um, the users of that product, like target customers, you could talk to your friends, you could do your, your entire research. You can come to a meeting and be like, oh, question? Thank you so much. Open your book, open your notebook, and then see the questions and be like, oh, I'm just going to ask you this one. Like, it's fine. Like, you don't have to memorize these questions. Come with a notebook, open your notebook, and make your questions. So be very, very prepared. So on the flip side, the exact opposite scenario also happens pretty, pretty often. So I had this amazing interview, and I'm like, wow, you're rocking it. I don't want this to end, but yeah, to ask a question. And then you get a question, and it's just like, just falls flat. I had this actually last month, this stellar product manager. I'm like, and I told her, like, you are you're the great. Yeah, perfect. And I'm like, you had a question. And she goes, can I work from home? Oh, no. And I'm like, uh, uh, like, I didn't even know what to say. Like, yes, fine. It's like, is this the most important thing for you to know this this moment? Like, this this is like this is how you're. This, what? I can I, I, Okay. So it's really like from, from then on, like I my decision was strong tire. But that question changed my entire perspective because yes, you have good answers, but like, is this the mindset that you're going to come to work every day? Is that the most important thing um, that you want to ask me right now? You have one shot. There's a good chance you'll never see me again. Like, is that the most important thing? Um, the funny thing, like when I was single and on dating apps, I, like, it would drive me nuts. The first question: Hey, what's up? How old are you? I'm like. Dude, seriously, like one question, how old, first of all, is how young are you? <laughs> Please. The second one is that question is going to define our relationship, which is not so likely after your question. Like, is that what you want to know about? Like it's, so make sure you have a great question. 
suggest that question is more um, directed to a thought from the company and the interviewer as opposed to yourself and what you learned from the job, but maybe it could be more of a like, well, what's the culture of the company? Actually, I'm, I'm glad you asked that. I, it wasn't part of my presentation, but now that I'm thinking, it actually should be. What kind of questions do we ask? I mean, I can't believe I did not at this point, but I'll just um, improv. So there are a couple of different question types. The first one is you can talk about the company's overall vision, where the company is going in the next couple of years, how the product is evolving, like what is, these are all the things that they don't really announce publicly. So you can talk about the evolution of the company. You can ask about the work environment. Here the questions are the culture, right? The um, team structure, the um, reporting structure. You can. It's totally fair to ask questions like, um, what? So for example, like if I join, if I get this role, like what are the opportunities? For me to advance in my career, what what does the career trajectory look like in your company? Um, what are the like? How can someone grow? So like asking questions about your because your, you're not applying for that role specifically. That role is a stepping stone for the next role, the next role within the company, right? So you want to. It's fair that you want to understand what your career looks like within the company. What are the, after you are a product manager for two, three years, what are, how can this role branch out? Are you gonna be a technical product manager? Can you be a designer? Like, so you can ask about your career. Other things is you can convert your opinions into an, a question. So let's say you have this idea that you are surprised that they're not doing. So it would be like, oh, have you guys considered X, Y, Z? Or like, I don't see your company applying X, Y, Z strategies. Have you guys considered it? Yes, have you guys tried? Like, what are the reasons? Like, I'm really curious. So that's basically, it's called asking for your career to solve. Because you, like, you had an idea, and you changed it into a question format, and, and now we know that you're smart, right? Cool. Um, so, the lesson to be learned here is curiosity beats the cat. Okay, I get it. You may not check all the boxes. No one ever does. Honestly, in my experience, no one ever does. This is where your passion comes into play. Show them why you care about this company. Show them why you care about the mission of the company. How you relate to the product. That's really important. Give them examples of things that you learned on the job. That's really important. So that we can tell that you're coaching them. Like, that, that is really important. Um, tell them how you would go about improving yourself in your areas of development, in the areas that you like experience. So we know that you acknowledge those areas because we knew about it anyways. Like this, the dude didn't have to tell me that he didn't have enough experience with data. Like I asked one question, I analyzed that. But it's his passion to overcome this and tackle this area is um, helping him. So you may not check all the boxes, but you sure have a plan to catch up. My last gem for you tonight, just be yourself. Be yourself. Don't try to be something you're not. And um, you're probably not a good actor anyways, or else you would be interviewing for Broadway. So just be yourself. Don't be shy or overly polite. Just relax. Confidence is the name of the game. Smile. Show your teeth. Crack a joke. Have a couple of like icebreakers. Right? Like, practice that. Be very friendly. And be honest. This is where I was going to talk about your areas of food, like your weaknesses, but you asked that question. Um, it was actually the grand finale of my presentation, and now you screwed it. <laughs> um, but yeah, so be, be very, very honest. Okay, so let's do a quick recap. Mm. Before the recap. Oh, recap, cool. So here's the recap. If you guys want to take a photo, I'll be smiling. <laughs> recap. Number one. Number one rule. No prep, 
No game. Crap, crap, crap. Go walk around the block, crap some more. This is the most important rule. Number two, keep it succinct. Gravity is the most important thing. Just tell me what I need to know. Number three, talk about your relevant background and how your skills are applicable to the job that you're interviewing for. Number four, focus on impact. This is incredibly important. Impact in terms of metrics, KPIs, preferably quantitative, but qualitative is okay too. Bring innovation. Guys, you guys are getting hired to make a change, to make, to innovate. Just remember that and bring that to the interview. Um, think about big solutions to problem solving questions. As I said, like this is probably the most important one, but think about that million dollar idea. Think about the number one thing to fix. Show your thought process for analytical questions. Again, nobody knows the answer. Nobody cares about the answer. It's about your thought process. How you break down that problem, what kind of data you look at, you look into, and how you use that logic. So it's thought process. For situational questions, give real life personal examples and reset <coughs> practicing. Flexing that muscle is the only way to answer these questions. Um, stay true to your role. Speak as a PM. You may have been a marketing person, a data analyst in the past, or an engineer, but now you're applying for a product manager role. So just remember that. Ask the right questions. This will, like, honestly, the interviewer will probably remember the last five or ten minutes of your interview. And that's why this is the most important thing. And guess what? If you do this part right, the rest of the interview matters much less because this is how you take over the interview and how you achieve the expected result. Show your passion that you really want this job more than anything in the world. You are born to do this job and convey that, like have that energy and be honest and talk about your passion throughout the interview. And lastly, be yourself. And remember, you are a rock star. You got this. Have confidence. You have absolutely nothing to lose. If you don't get the job, you're going to go to Red Lobster and get some biscuits and feel good about it. There's no such thing as missing the right opportunity. The right opportunity is the one you get, so use it wisely. Thank you so much, everyone. It's been such a Um, I hope you guys found it useful. I think we have a couple of minutes to um, for questions and yeah. <laughs> Yeah, question. What um, the the question was? What is the most critical one in that list? Um, I think I mentioned it, but I'll say it again. The um, focusing on big solutions is the most important. Honestly, like I inter sometimes I do batches of interviews. I interview twelve people in one day, and then to multiply that by five to find that perfect person. Do you think, I mean, I'm an Olympic note taker, but do you think I'm going to remember everything that you said? No. I'm going to remember two things. That aha moment that I'm like, wow, that big idea. I interviewed a dozen people. No one told me. I will remember that moment. And number two is asking the right question because I and people have a tendency to remember the end of the interview. So asking the right question is the second most important. <coughs> As a product manager in Facebook, would you work on... So, um, let me pause on that question because it's about a Facebook question and not relevant, but we're going to have a mixer after this and I'll come find you and if not, you find me and I'll talk about the structure. Do you mean in terms of something negative about your product? It's more like they want you to tell, tell me a moment that you think. Tell me a moment that you think. 
Oh, yeah. I mean, history is full of um, not the other person. Yeah. The um, my failures. Like, if anyone who tells that they did not fail is probably lying. So, being really like. I'd rather have you fail 10 times and learn 10 lessons than no failure because there's no lesson. So just because you failed in the past is not meaning, it, it actually guarantees that you're not going to fail again in that area because you learned your lesson the hard way. So be honest and say, hey, this is the lesson I learned. It was five years ago. It's probably one of the biggest um, mistakes. And since then, this is what I learned. This is and this is now. This is how I avoid it. So be honest with that. How many times a day in the question you want to ask is great question. The question is for you guys in here that how do I gauge how many questions I want to ask? Um, I love asking a lot of questions. That's why in the beginning of the interview, I even tell them like. I actually have this written up, and before I interview, I send this these tips. Like it's actually it's an article that I can share with you guys too. It's written like my speaker notes. I actually send it to the candidate and say, "Hey, these are the things I'm looking for." So hopefully by then they know that when I ask a question, they have two three minutes to answer, and then I can always ask follow up questions. Yeah. So hopefully they're not gonna talk and talk and talk for five to ten minutes. Because if the interview was 30 to 45 minutes and I have like 10 questions, like it's you really have three to four minutes to answer each of them. So you really want me to um, get to like, get the um, answers that I need for you. So um, I guess to answer your question, it depends. I typically like asking about 10 questions, but more often than not, by the time I ask the fifth question, the interview is over. That's a great question. Um, post interview, what do I do with it? Um, my honest opinion is I find it very helpful. Especially if you know that a job posting has been open for a while, That's, that means I've been interviewing a lot of people. So, and to refresh my memory, I think it's good. But I do not like simple emails like, oh, it's been such a pleasure talking to you. I'm um, looking forward to hearing from you. That's to me, you're creating noise in my inbox. But I'll tell you a couple of um, Good examples I've received actually in the last couple of months. Um, a couple of people followed up with, in like, they're like, oh, remember you asked me about my million dollar question and I gave you an answer? You know what? I did some thinking on it and I would like to submit a couple of more answers. And those answers, like, I was celebrating while reading that email. I'm like, wow, that's totally fine. I mean, million, you don't just come up with million dollar questions. like. It's okay, but you thought about it for two days, and then you reach out to me. So they actually put together a deck, some wireframes, some like mock-up if they use um, mock-up tools. And I'm like, wow! And I can't count the number of times that I actually thought the interview was met. And then their follow-up was like five slides to be part of my presentation about like amazing ideas or they rephrased the, um, their answer to that. That was super, super, super helpful. So, um, yeah, so basically if you are going to follow up with an email, which I would recommend, make sure that, that, that like, you already, I don't want to say wasted my time, but you, got, you already got my attention, right? I'm looking at it, so you better tell me something mind-blowing and um, that may change my answer and that happens. Follow up on that. Let's say you meet you had an interview with five of you. Would you recommend the job only or something? Thank you to the hiring manager because we can have a decision. Good question. Uh, follow up question. Who do we send the email to? Um, it depends. 
I would definitely, if you interviewed with five people and you know that two of them you did okay, or you could tell in their face that they weren't as satisfied with your answers, first of all, start with those. Um, and be like, hey, by the way, you asked me these couple of questions, I had a chance to do some more thinking, and here's what I had in mind. So, there's no number, but if, yeah, so a hiring manager can say thank you. But again, just never send just single thank you message. Let's do someone different, yeah. So, this assumes that you already got the attention of the hiring manager and you got the interview. But what about getting somebody's attention in the first place you get the interview, especially if you're not in Ask it again. How, how, how do you get somebody's attention to actually get the interview? Oh, okay. This is this is a good one. Again, I realized it wasn't in the scope of my presentation. Huh. First of all, you got my attention. So if you need a job, I will definitely talk to you. About it. So like basically, like in in networking events like this, I think it's really important that you put yourself out there. Um, it's, you guys probably think that I'm the biggest extrovert in the world. Rebecca knows I despise small talk, but I hate these industry events and I ask you questions. I'm like that person just like drinking in the corner. Um, so, but if you, the moment you get out there, raise your hand and ask a question, that always helps. The second one is um, the, 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 what you send with your application. So. I didn't get this question, but oftentimes I get, should I send a cover letter? Well, again, it depends. If you want to get my attention, that cover letter needs to be very unique. There's actually cover letter generators out there online that can like, copy paste different things. And 90% of the cover letters really like, sound the same, look the same. I'm like, I'm an overachiever, I do this, I do that, I'm self-driven. And they even put it on their resume at the top, Valentine. Self-driven, data oriented, project manager, all these like hashtags that you have. Like it's that's not how you're gonna get my attention. But like, when I get a cover letter that says, like, have you guys considered doing XYZ? Or I have this million dollar idea before the interview, I see a cover letter that's two paragraphs. The first paragraph is this is what I want to build on your website. Right? Um like this is my idea, and this is actually what I tried to do in the past as an app developer myself. I couldn't. If I come to Bands in Town, I may bring a lot of value. This is my million dollar idea. I may or may not like the idea, but this is how you're going to get differentiated. So resumes, they all look the same, feel the same. They're boring AF. So it's this. You may not get differentiated. Uh, obviously, you can do little things, make it more visual, on the logos, change the font, um, like make it custom to that brand. Like some, one person sent me a um, when I was at Facebook, their resume was actually a Facebook profile. So it's they put all their work information and everything. Instead of resume, they created a Facebook profile with that. That was the resume. I mean, I. Yeah, A for Africa, great creatively, like they really surfaced themselves out uh, of that. So that was a good trick. Um, but other than that, content is really important. And the cover letter, um, it only has something different to say. So coincidentally, I'm from Singapore. You got that time zone, right? What you say? I'm from Singapore. Yeah. Yeah, so you got that time zone, right? <laughs> Um, so my question would be more about like uh, different course skills you have to offer product manager. Like uh, you gotta learn, I mean, know some aspects of coding. You gotta know some aspects of data, project management, and all that. And uh, as much as product management is uh, about developing a product, it's also about managing people. So personally, which area do you value the most when you when you are looking at course skills? That's a great question. The question is just rephrase in case you guys didn't hear. What what do I value most in a candidate when it comes to um, the end role? Is it the technical background? Is it the people managing? Is it design data? Do I get your question yeah. right? Yeah. So there is not one right answer for that. It's actually it depends. Like when we're hiring product managers in different offices and the qualities we're looking at. 
are different. For um, one role, we may be looking for technical product managers, like there is a difference between PM and TPM, like technical PM. So if that's the case, then we definitely want someone with that kind of technical experience. I may need QA um, expertise, maybe that I'm looking for that, but maybe the PM is going to be in charge of also the QA because we don't have a um, um, QA person, like a certified QA person, so we're trying to address that part of the business with the PM role. Maybe at Facebook, I we have like 10 PMs for a little button on Facebook because they have variety of people, so we need people with people managing expertise to manage other PMs. So that's definitely, that depends on the role, and I think the requirements of the role yeah, of solution that you can do. Yeah, uh, I've actually been uh, lucky enough to bother a number of people in the position at the top of the product pyramid, and most of them have told me that the hardest thing to find in a PM is empathy. Uh, first of all, do you agree? And if you agree, okay, so you agree. Uh, what is the best way for us to demonstrate empathy in the hiring process? If, if you have an example of it. That's great. It's, um, so, I guess everybody heard the question, what's the what, um, empathy? I agree that that's probably the most difficult quality to find and the most important one as well. And that's, that applies to all aspects of life, even like friendship or love, it's like empathy. It's like, um, let me not find it. Um, it's what is a good way to build empathy. So I, I know a couple of ways and I utilize it on a daily basis. Number one, putting yourself in the shoes of your um, customers. And how are you going to do that? You can't just be like, oh, let's say you're building a device for kids, right? Like you're building a product for four to seven year old kids. Like, like, oh, if I were a kid, you can't just talk to a thing like that. You need to interview these people. It could be focus groups, it could be surveys, it could be um, just like talking to these people. Like, I'm truly understanding. It's, um, what is that lady on TED Talks talks about? I can't remember, but she says, I'm quoting without the name of the person, but she says, empathy is developed by listening. And it's, yeah, but if only you listen, you will actually understand what's going on in the head of that person. So that's number one, listen. Number two, oh, another one that um, I actually listened to in a podcast, the um, founder of Airbnb um, had this exercise. He knew that most of his customers, like, he probably had like 40 people visiting his page at the time, like at early stages. Um, most of the people were located in New York, so he actually flew to New York and he would knock on people's door and like, ask about their um, problems on big, like daily problems, but what's why do they prefer Airbnb? And one thing that I will never forget is he would ask this question again, exaggerating, like hey, he would say, "What can I do for you and for Airbnb that's going to make you go outside and talk?" about our product to every single person. Like, how can I make you talk about Airbnb to everyone you know? <laughs> so it's only then that you're going to get good, um, good results. Another one is, um, I think well, it was Walt Disney. Again, I'm like really not good with my facts tonight. But um, I think Walt Disney, when he built Disneyland, I remember an anecdote, he walked for weeks and months on his knees so that he could see the experience as a seven-year-old child. Instead of walking like a tall man, he was walking on his knees so that he could see what he built from a kid's perspective. So I thought that was an incredible way to create empathy. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's basically, that that is really, really important. So. Again, when you interview, you may interview for a product that's, let's say, it's a um, accessibility product for people with sort of handicap, whatever. So you, thank God, you are not in that situation. But how are you gonna know what a blind person feels like? Or well, maybe you're going to just like tap your eyes and like 
and your client, and that's how you're going to build the right product and understand. So find that methodology, whatever works, walk on your knees, close your eyes, or whatever, um, do that. If you can't do it, then talk to those people, and ask them questions, like watch them use your product, and how they engage with it. And that would be my best thing for Thank you. Last question. With a uh, last question. Last question. No. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Okay. With situational questions, are bold assumptions ever um, made or backfired? What kind of assumption? Uh, bold assumptions. Let's say for the um, the example that you used uh, for how many people are sitting in the world. If I were to assume that there's only 24 million people in the world. Gotcha. Great question. Um, going back to what I said about situational questions. I said, you need to make an assumption. The only way to solve these problems, you, have a, you need a starting point. He asks, what if your assumption is wrong, then the answer is going to be wrong. That is totally fine, because I don't care about the answer. I care about your thought process. If the assumption is wrong, but your thought process is right, at the end of it, we could go to Google and Google the world population and plug that number to your hypothesis, to your process and it would lead the right result. So the data is always available. The thought process is that. Yes! Oh my god, I would yeah, Renee Brown. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Renee Brown, if you guys haven't watched the TED video or uh, her books are amazing too, Renee Brown. Um, she talks about empathy and I think she does a phenomenal job. Yeah, and I think as a product manager maybe I'll benefit from it.